just theatrical. Like, <laughs> praise the Lord. Donna, Donna Wonder created that. She did an amazing job on that intro. I said, I wanted, I told her, I said, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for Braveheart. I think she, she pulled it off, praise the Lord. So I was going to come up with a sword. And, no, I wouldn't do that, praise the Lord. Anyhow, as, uh, as uh, Jordan said, I'm getting a little bit of an echo up here, guys. Uh, as Jordan said um, in the welcome, we are in uh, part two of a I don't know how long message series uh, that is going to take us deep into the book of Hebrews. Had a lot of uh, good feedback from last week. I had some people say, man, I was hoping you just kind of like dive in. I did a lot of information uh, last week. And, and, and I, know, I know sometimes as, as pastors and Teachers or even people just sitting like in the community, like like you want some of the like really motivational and what we call like the pastoral stuff when you like you like get you going and like get out there and take a squirt gun and go storm the gates of hell, right? And sometimes though to, to get to that place, you gotta have information and you gotta have an understanding of certain letters that are written. And I wish I could tell you today that I'm going to have a lot more, you know, more of the squirt gun storming the gates of hell. Unfortunately, I do not. It's going to be a little bit more information. And the reason for this, and you're going to see this throughout, and I'll probably mention it several times. To understand why a letter is written, to understand its importance in your life, in my life, you have to have kind of the whole, you know, the boring stuff that we kind of roll back. Now, now I get it. There are some of you that you are just like, this is, this is your stuff, all right? You're like, I love this. And everybody else is like, yeah, shut up. We don't, we don't want to. We want the good, you know, Mike screaming and shouting from the platform and spitting all over his iPad. And although that's fun, it really is. And it really motivates us and it encourages us. But to get to that place, we got to understand some certain facts that are so vital to us uh, in there. And so today, it's going to be, I think it'll be a little bit of a mix of both. I think you'll see a little bit of both, uh, but there is going to be some more information. And I want you, like, if you can, don't just listen. Engage. And you may not engage down there like, you know, having a, you know, we're, we're not midrashing, um, but where you're taking notes, like write this stuff down, go back and study for yourself, right? Paul encouraged uh, his, his protege, Timothy, study to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, this is the key word, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if anything, in our movement, this uh, uh, modern-day Judean Christians, something we need is truth and rightly dividing Yahweh's word because there are a lot of stuff. And if you don't know how to divide Yahweh's word, but you get your understanding or your information from the University of YouTube, you're going to have a very hard time with Scripture, and you're going to be deceived. And really, that's really where I'm going to go today, because there's some facts that I want to give us and some things that I feel like we need to understand. And it's interesting, because even as we were worshiped, the Lord was downloading something else that I'm hoping I can remember this, and, and hopefully he'll bring it back to my remembrance when we get to a, a, a certain aspect. But I want to continue on in this vein and continuing this where we left off. If you remember, we didn't get real far last week. Matter of fact, I think we barely got into chapter, no, we wish, right? I was about to say chapter two. I praise the Lord. That would have been a miracle. No, it was more just chapter one into verse two. And I'm going to tell you, we're not going to get much farther today. Maybe a couple of verses because of what we're going to talk about is essential. And you'll see why. In a moment, last week we wrapped up or we exposed the truth of Yeshua that although Yahweh spoke into the prophets dealing with the Jewish people, he's trying to communicate a message. You got to get this. The book of Hebrews is communicating a message to the Jewish people by a Jewish author. And if you miss that, then what's going to happen is what you begin to read the book of Hebrews, you will also become deceived or you'll be misguided into terms and phrases and things that we're going to talk about throughout this series. So you've got to understand who it's written to. It's written to Jewish people. Now you may say, well, Pastor Mike, I'm not a Jew, so why are we going through this? Because we're a modern day Judean church. We're modern day Judean. We are Judeo-Christians. Living in the 2022nd century, whatever century we're in, praise the Lord, right? That's who we are. 
And if there's ever been a book, in my opinion, in this movement that's been literally misguided, misquoted, it is the book of Hebrews. This is a powerful letter to his promised people. And we've got to grab a hold of that. So he says that, yes, in the past, within the, and he's talking primarily through the Pentateuch or the Tanakh, uh, the Torah, however you want to, uh, want to, what word you want to use. Primarily in those times, when we go back through and we look at, we look at the, the Torah, and we look at the book of the prophets, and we look at the, the, the books of the writings, right? When we look at that, who do we see speaking primarily? It is Yahweh speaking through prophets, right? And he didn't do it just through, like, it's always been done, and you see this time and time again. He does it how? Through dreams and through visions. And he still does that today. Now, notice, he's not saying that that's done away with. He's trying to convey something to the Jewish people because the Jewish people wouldn't take anything unless it was done through the prophets. It had to come through them. And so he's building rapport. That's what we discovered last week. He's building this amazing rapport so that he can really bring some truth to the Jewish people and to us. And then he goes on to say in verse 2, he says now, he said in former days he spoke through the prophets, but now in these last days. And what we did last week is we established this understanding of what last days mean. They believed, and the rabbis, and even, uh, so this is, even in these last days is Judean talk, it's Jewish talk. And he's saying, look, in these last, well, what can, what, what's the last days mean, right? For us that are living in this century, we would say today we're living in the last days. But back then, and even now, they believe that the last days began when Yeshua resurrected. That's when the last days began. So that means we've been in the last days for a, a season, right? It reminds me of when Robbie, <laughs> when Robbie years ago, when we were just starting out, she asked, uh, you know, we didn't have a, a children's uh, overseer, someone to watch the children's ministries back there. And so uh, we were at dinner, and um, I so lovingly asked her, I said, would you run the children's ministry for a season? She's still running the children's ministry. The season is, it's just an extended season. She's even asked me before, when is the season over with? I said, only the Lord, Robin, knows. Only the Lord. Praise, that's my out, right? Like, hey, you'll pray about it, praise God. But it's almost the same thing here, right? We think like, like the, the end of times or the last days is not new. And they knew that this is language that a Jewish reader, a Jewish, uh, uh, who he's speaking to, the community he's speaking to, they understood what he was saying. They understood this idea. But in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, let's go, let's just get right into it, because I've got a, I've got a lot to cover. But in Hebrews chapter 1, 2, we read this last week, but man, we're going to hang out, man, for a little bit, because this is some good stuff. It says that in these last days, he has spoken to us through a son. Now, we established this last week. If you missed last week, I want to encourage you, go back and look at the teaching when we talked about what he's saying. He's not talking about a son like, like Caleb, like me and Caleb, he's my son. He's talking about something much, much bigger, and the Hebrews knew exactly what he's speaking about. We'll see a little bit of that again tonight or this morning. He said, through a son whom he appointed heir of all things, all things. And through whom, this is, pow this is powerful, I want to hang out here this morning. Through whom he created the universe. You see that? I mean, these last few words here should pique a little bit of our curiosity. Now, I'm going to jump into something that we've really, I've really talked about for quite a bit. Matter of fact, if you were here for Yom Kippur, we kind of touched base quite a bit on this, uh, on dealing with kind of the deity of Messiah. I felt like, like I can't even go into the Hebrews, into the letter of Hebrews, unless we really establish this authority that Yahweh has given to the Son, Messiah. And it's powerful, because what we're seeing is some powerful wording that you're going to see. And I know you may say, well, Mike, you talk about this a lot, because it's so critical in these last days. Some of you got that. Some of you are going to miss it. Understanding who Messiah is is so critical to today's times. Well, what do you mean? We'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to get there. 
But understand that the reason why we've got to talk about this, man, is so critical to who you are right now and to what's going to happen in the future. We don't want to miss this. This last phrase that he quotes back here, this last phrase, though whom he created the universe, these six words really opens up a powerful understanding and will be the basis for today's message. If we could just hang on that for a while, which we could. And I'm going to bring it from a perspective that maybe you've never heard before. See, we know, and based upon Scripture, he created the universe through Yeshua. Right? We'll look at more about that. He created everything. Now, I want you to take this into consideration. When we think about being created in the image of Yahweh, most of us in this room would never, like, like okay, yeah, I, I get it, I'm created in God. But it's the same God that created the heavens and the earth, every star that's in place, everything that you see, feel, and touch, the lakes, the water, the, the fields, grass, animals, everything was created. Everything was created by Yahweh. And none of us in this room have a problem with that. But I really want us to think deep into that for a second. You were created. You were created by God. Why do we worship God? Think about that for a moment. I want you to think about it. This is a deep question. Like, like, let's get really into the mud this morning. Why do you worship him? I submit to you today you worship him because he created everything. And you know it. You know that you were created in his image. You know that every star that's in heaven he placed there. That's what causes you to worship him. That's what causes you to identify him as God, the creator. No argument there. Listen, listen how quiet it is. Wow. Like, have you ever sat in a room and just, like, just think through that for a moment? That you were created by Yahweh. That's heavy. Like, we can just stop today. We can just like, you know what? Let's bring the worship team back up. And let's just worship him for the fact that he created you. He gave you breath. He gave you life. Your little puppy, your little dog that you love so much, God. I like cats, by the way. And I wasn't always a cat lover. The Lord redeemed me from that. I have two male cats that are absolutely just my joy as a gift from um, some friends. I love it. And one of them, man, um, my black and white one, we call him Tux because he looks like he's wearing a tuxedo. And Tux, man, he's, they both have their interesting personalities. Like Tuck, he wants to be held. And when he holds, when you pick him up, he's just going to like put his paws right here, his head right here. His, he knows where his back legs go, and he's good. Like he's just like, I'm going to settle in here for a little while. It doesn't matter. You call him, come here, Tux. He'll come right to you, jump in your lap, and he wants to be held. He doesn't fight you. Now, we have another one we call Tuck. Not Tuck, Tom. I'm sorry, Tom. Tom is a little rebellious. He doesn't want you holding him. He will like, he's the guy that you, you hold him, you pick him up, and he's like, put me down, put me down, put me down. That's, that's him. There's a point to what I'm making. Let me share my story. Like, what does this have to do with God? In a minute. But here's the thing that I love about Tom, is wherever I go on the property, Tom is going to be right there with me. Most of the time, he's going to cause you to trip, because he'll walk right between your eight legs. And what he does when he walks, it's so beautiful, he looks up at you, like making sure you're still walking with him and you're going the same direction. He wants to make sure you're going the same way that he's going. Great cats, great personalities. What's my point? God. God created those animals. God created the intelligence of those animals. Why do we worship God? Because of creation. I mean, think about it. Who else, if we don't worship him, Yahweh says, I'll cause the rocks to cry out and worship me. Who could do that but God? So why are we talking about identity? Why are we talking about Messiah and deity? God, in all of his creation, he created something. Now, I want to paint a picture and build this up because I want you to see some scripture that is going to blow your mind. That when we think about who God is and everything that he has done, it should do two things, I hope, by the time we leave. Number one, I hope you have a, a better understanding of your relationship that you have with Yahweh. 
But the second thing is the authority that you've been given because of Yahweh. I hope we cover that today. So I want to jump down to the next verse as we see that he holds the universe. Watch this description that he begins to bring out. In Hebrews 1.3, he said, The sun is the radiance of his glory and the imprint of his being, upholding all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for our sins, what does he do? He sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, this is very, very cool because if you, if you don't understand kind of the Hebrew idioms that's pre presented in this passage, it's absolutely crazy. Like, like that last one that I'm holding on, the word right hand. It's not necessarily a position physical, but a position spiritual. It represents authority. That because what Yeshua did, his authority is God's. That, 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 that'll preach all day long, man. That'll preach. It's so good to understand the right hand and his authority. But I want to go back. Let's look at this again just for a review before we really get into this. So I want to see it. This son is the radiance of his glory. You should be underlining that in your scriptures or at least writing it down somewhere. And watch this one. And what? The Get back. Go you get back there. Are we fighting? I must have hit the wrong button then. I'm, I'm going to blame me then for now. Everybody knows when the media team's back there because something gets messed up. And... So we got the radiance of his glory. This is my favorite right there. The imprint of his being. Very important. Upholding all things by his how? His word. Powerful word. When he had made purification for our sins, he went, he sits down at the right hand of his majesty on high. Now, I know we've discussed this, man, thoroughly when we did Yom Kippur. And we talked about the Kohen Gadol. But I think we need to look at this text from the perspective of what we talked about on Yom Kippur. And we need to go deeper into a deeper understanding to bring out some nuggets, I think, that will help us understand the two things that we're talking about in having you really appreciate the walk that we have and the life that we have and hopefully that motivates us in some way, some fashion, to trust Yahweh with the simple things as well as, 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 well as the difficult things. I love this that he says in the beginning in chapter, in the verse 2, he talks about his son. And we talked about this last week, but we got to understand, that's a, that's, a, that's a truth bomb that's being dropped on them. Because they don't believe, listen, the Jewish people don't believe in Yeshua. They, they believe that we're practicing uh, either multi-gods or we're worshiping multi-god because we worship Yeshua. Or they believe that we're paganists. So for him to say, my son, wow, that's a, like a game changer for the people in Hebrew. But he's doing something to establish relationship, to establish context. Remember, if you're writing a letter, the very first words of your letter are going to be the reason why you are writing that letter. That's what you're going to do. Like, dear Jordan, wanted to reach out to you today and whatever. Right? What are you doing? You're establishing in the letter. What is he doing? He's establishing something to the Hebrew people, and he's establishing a foundation of why you should listen to me, or him, rather, in this letter. So truth bomb. Now, I want to go back and look at some very interesting words. The first word that we see in that text, I'm going to push this back, is right here, right there. The radiance of his glory. In Greek, it's apagosoma, meaning brilliance of his light. Like, what does this mean about anything? Hang on. You'll see here in a minute. In other words, whomever this is that he's describing as the sun, whatever, whoever this is, he is the exact replica of the Father, the brilliance of him, the brilliance of the Father. But wait, I want to show you something else, which is that next word, which is super powerful, and that's that word right there, the imprint. See, this is why I think sometimes I think it's so good that you at least try to familiarize yourself with some original language. The word imprint is the Hebrew, it's, it means character. 
Think about that. It's the character of someone. Like he's saying, this is the exact replica of the Father. Like this is the light, the glory, the uniqueness, the brilliance. Like remember what we said, why do we worship Yahweh? Look at what the author is suggesting here. This is, it, goes, it gets better. This word imprint means an exact copy or reproduction. It's understood as, watch this, an exact expression. An exact expression. That's why, like, when Caleb and I are together, you can see tidbits of Caleb, but not an exact replica of me. Same thing with my older son, Jake. Jake looks a lot like me, right? He has some of my mannerisms, but he's not an exact image. He's not an imprint of me. He has some of my characteristics. That's why when we look at the word son, we have to understand this, this meaning behind it, how big it is. It's not just like Caleb or Jake or like I was watching uh, Samuel up here playing and I was watching some of his facial expressions and I'm like, there's Jordan. Like, it's Jordan. Sorry, I may not have done you right, brother. Your son does a lot better job. But he's an exact replica, an exact expression of this father. This is the result of printing or engraving with the stamp. It literally is like imprint. Who's the imprint of? God. Now, to kind of really work into this, I want to show you a couple of verses. It's pretty, pretty cool. I should have went back. If I don't go back after a while, I'll go ahead and make it back. I kind of get lost. Anyway. Look at this, Isaiah 42 and 8. I love this. I am, we use the word in the, in the TLV, uh, the, the Tree of Life version, it says Adonai. But in actual study, we're going to see something that's very, very, very powerful. This is actually the word Yodhe Vav or what we use, the word Yahweh. That is my name. Now, this is important, all right? I want to show you something. Now, this is going to require some participation from you, you guys, Okay. Isaiah 42 and 8 says, I am who? Yahweh, or Adonai, whatever phrase you're comfortable with. That is my name. Now watch this. My glory I will not give to another. To another. It's big. Or my praise a griven image. Now let me ask you a question. I know I've already asked it, but let me ask it one more time for the people in the back. Who is speaking here? Come on now. If you're not sure, yell it out anyway, whatever your neighbor says, okay? Unless it's something weird, then don't yell out what they're saying. Notice that Yahweh says something very significant in this text. We all agree that God is speaking, yes or no? If you don't believe God's speaking, go ahead and leave the room. No, I'm kidding. Just stay right here. I am Adonai, that is my name. My glory I will not give to another or my praise given to graven images. Notice here, Yahweh will not share his glory with anyone. This is why we talk a lot about the heart of people. Because sometimes we can inadvertently allow things to sit on the throne of our hearts that belong to Yahweh. And in, 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 based upon Isaiah, you're literally giving the glory of Yahweh to something or someone else. This is why we got to make sure Right? We have to check our heart. Right, A, little, a friend of mine used to say, you've got to get a check up from the neck up. You've got to look into your heart. What's really on my heart? What's really in there? We can even say things like, why do I really go to church? Because we can worship even this and not worship him. We can worship worship. We've talked about that before, right? You can worship all sorts of things. You can worship tradition more than you worship Yahweh, hello Pharisees. Like, we have to stop and think sometimes, don't we? Like, like, what is on the throne? Because according to Isaiah 42 and 8, he says he does not share his glory with anyone. No one. There can only be one conclusion then by looking at this text. Isaiah 42 and 8. If he's not going to share his glory, then the glory that we see being mentioned in the letter of Hebrews can only mean 
that it's a reflection of Yahweh himself, yod heh That's all we can conclude. We can't conclude anything else. I don't remember who told me this, but I'm like, man, that's such a game changer. We were talking about kind of this very subject, and the individual said something of the nature of, you know, if, if, if God, like, created man and then put, you know, made him come to heaven and, or come to earth and, and then take the death and then made him some type of incarnate, right? Uh, so what God, uh, you know, essentially did was he take something that was his job, his redemption, and put it onto someone else. To do. When you think of the weight of our redemption and the cost of our redemption, there's no way we can get this from anyone else or anything else. It has to be a reflection of Yahweh, an imprint. Now watch, let's not stop there. Let's go on to, I guess we are going to stop there. Oh, there we go, my glory. Well, praise the Lord. Sometimes you create this and you forget what you're doing. You get up here and you just preach, praise the Lord. Now, this is, this is going to be really good. Okay, this is like, I love it when Yahweh's word just comes alive and all we got to do is study the word. What does it, Paul, we say? You know, read the Bible, pray, and what? Repeat. Some of you all heard the message. Some of you all forgot. All right. And repeat. Psalms 101 and 1. Or 110. I'm sorry. Psalms 110 and 1. I love this. Don't miss this. Psalms 110 and 1. A Psalm of David. Adonai declared. Now remember, we already kind of established this, this word here that we're using, Adonai, as Yahweh or yod heh vav um, Let's do a little Hebrew lesson here real quick, all right? So let's look at this, right? So Yahweh. Yahweh can mean either Adonai. They use Adonai because the Hebrews don't believe in saying the name Yahweh or yod heh vav They believe it's such a holy name that they don't want to mention it. So that's why they come up with Adonai instead of saying Yahweh. All right? We're good? This is yod heh vav Yahweh is the interpretation, the name of God of Israel given to the Israelites through Moshe. This is what we call him. Now, this is not a sacred name message, so calm down. If you say God, I know who you're talking about. Matter of fact, we were in prison, and um, Jordan and I, uh, at the end of our, our kind of what we do in there, um, we give him a chance to ask questions. And we had a young man that was our, a first-time guest for our service, and he asked me that question. He said, he said, what do you believe about God's name? And I knew what the question really was. The question that really was is, do you believe that if you don't say, if you say Jesus, then you're worshiping the, the uh, what is it, uh, uh, what's his name, son or offspring of Zeus or something, right? Because that's what sacred namers believe. I don't take to that. I believe Yahweh knows my heart. And the Yeshua, Jesus, that I came to him and repented of is the Yeshua, Jesus, that died on the cross. So this isn't a sacred name message. I just want you to understand a little bit of Hebrew. When we look at the names and we see scriptures like this, a psalm of David, Adonai declares, we need to know exactly what's happening and who's talking in this text. Continuing on, so we got Yahweh, Adonai, or Yahweh. And then we have the rest of the verse. Adonai declares, to my Lord. Now, wait a minute now. We got something sneaking up on us here. Now, notice, though, it's, my Lord. So is Yahweh bipolar? Is he like, like talking to himself? No, I think there's something very significant here. I think David is seeing something in the supernatural. Watch. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool or your feet. This is beautiful. This word Lord isn't what we think. Somebody get this now. Look at that. It's Adon in the Hebrew. It's Lord God. It's literally a position. It's positional authority. It's like you call me Pastor Mike, or some people call me Pastor Mike. And that's just simply a position of authority. Yahweh is expressing something very deep right here. It's, this is a term that refers to the God of Israel reflecting his authority, literally talking about the authority. Now, this is going to make sense in a moment and how it all comes together. We have to understand, this is beautiful. 
And it should wake, awaken us up to how God is or who God is. What He looks like. I do not believe for the most part that I need to convince most of you here and even online, those who have joined us online, of the deity of Yeshua. I don't believe that. I know most of you. I know most of your faith. I've talked to many of you. Um, but I, do, I don't believe that I need to convince that. But the reason for such strong emphasis on this to- topic and why I'm like pretty strong in this thing is because the Messianic movement, we are so sus- are, we're, we're so susceptible inside the, me- the Messianic movement. And, and I know this doesn't apply to everyone, guys. I understand it doesn't apply to every person. But we're so susceptible to someone coming in and bringing a spirit of confusion. But if even more than that, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, if there were ever a topic that we needed to be grounded in and have a clear, if not a clearer, understanding... I believe that this one should be at the top of our list. Even greater than some of the traditions that we typically try to follow. I think this one really needs to... We, you, here, let me say it like this. Every one of you on your own need to have a come to Yahweh meeting. And you need to answer the question. Who is Yahweh to you? It's deep powerful because you know something there is coming a day now i don't know if we'll be here i don't know if we will guys i don't but there is going to be coming a day where that question is going to be prevalent and that question is going to be the most important question to humanity and that question is going to bring some people to a guillotine or to a prison cell or at the end of a bullet that question Today we live in comfort. Today we live everything's good. We can get anything we want. We're not, we're not judged because we wear zit zits or our talit or we worship on the Shabbat. Oh, we may have some people that think we're weird, but we've answered that question for you already. There's some weird people here. We know it. You just don't know it. Right? I mean, think about this. There is coming a day when the thing that's going to mean something is who do you say is God? I think sometimes we look at stuff like this and we just brush right through it because maybe of how deep it may think or we, we seem to think of, of how deep trying to figure who Yahweh is. But it's not as hard as we think it is. Not when we look at the Bible. Not when we look at Scripture. And certainly not when we look at Messiah. Messiah. God reveals himself by speaking through his son. In our day, when tolerance is a cry from every corner, any claim from a religious authority meets stubborn resistance. The greatest argument that I have heard when people, like when we start getting into theology or apologetics or you're trying to witness to someone, especially someone who believes they have this kind of worldly wisdom, and they'll say, well, who do you believe God is? And when you say things like what Yeshua said, that no man cometh by the Father by the way of me, they absolutely go ballistic. Are you saying there's only one God? Yeah. Kind of. Because there's a spirit of rebellion and a spirit of stubbornness. We don't want in human nature, now sitting just the man, the man person, the, the Adam aside, we don't like the idea of having to submit ourselves to someone. That goes against our human nature, i.e., the Tower of Babel. We'll make ourselves like God, we'll build our tower up to Him. Lucifer himself, I'll make my stars, I'll make my throne as high as his. People will worship me. We don't like the idea that we have to submit ugly words to authority. We see it everywhere. 
And it only increases as the love for many decreases. Rebellion and anti-lawliness will increase. And it's going to come by way of rebellion. And I'm not talking about rebellion like, like the Civil War rebellion. I'm talking about rebellion to anything that represents good. And if you don't know where you stand, you will fall for anything. You will be deceived. This isn't about trying to figure out if you want to be Hebrew or not, or if you want to be Messianic. It's not about that. It's about who do you say God is. Because if you don't know who God is, then anybody can come down in an imitation form and deceive you. We need to know this stuff, church. The idea that we are to submit to some sort of an authority brings hatred and rebellion from those whose hearts are far from Elohim, far from Yahweh. See, we're not taught that in the Bible, in, in, as, as the body of Christ, are we? We're supposed to humble ourselves. We did a whole message series on that. We're to walk in humility. To understand and believe that there's one God and he's the one that we're to worship means everything else is a lie. Everything is a lie. And in the world that we live in, they do not like that. Hebrews is claiming that Yahweh spoke through his son. Can you imagine this for a moment? The weight of this claim. And he not only does that, but he does it through a complete revelation of himself. When Yeshua was revealed in his true glory at the transfiguration, watch this. We we see that in Matthew 17, 1 through 13. Most of you all know the story. Moses and Elijah appear to Messiah. I love this image, right? Who's standing before him? Not just any other prophet. Not just any prophet. Like Moses and Elijah, why them? But because Jews regarded Moses and Elijah as the two greatest prophets. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. This is like, you want to talk about completeness of Yahweh's plan, right? You have Moses, Elijah, and Messiah. His image. Ooh, come on, somebody. Man. These two men had performed many miracles and were great leaders. Yet, what does God say? Oh, come on. What does he say? You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Mark 1.11. Jesus Christ should be our, our, be our highest authority for faith and daily living. Something we preach so much here at Epic Life. That yes, we are a Torah. We're first century Judean. We're Judeo Christians. But let me tell you something. The focus has to be on the king. It has to be on Jesus, lest we create our own idols, lest we create our own image of Yahweh. So hopefully, that's the introduction, without too much repetitive, no, I'm kidding, calm down, calm down, we'll have own egg. But I don't want to repeat a bunch from Yom Kippur, so I want to bring this from a different a different perspective, like when we look at Hebrews and these beginning words, I want you to feel the weight of what the author is declaring. Let's look at some more evidence. One of the strongest texts, one of the strongest texts that I've set up right along with the book of Isaiah 43, 45, 46, ones that I, I talked about in Yom Kippur, these messages that reflect Yeshua and Jesus together is powerful. And the greatest text, most of you all probably know where I'm going. Uh, you're way smarter than I am. Praise the Lord. And that's Genesis 126. If you needed evidence to support this argument, I just want to look at this for a moment. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the flying creatures of the sky, over the livestock, over the whole earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the land. God created humankind in his image. Oh, pardon me. I look excited. In his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The thing that you need to notice about this passage, and the reason why I highlighted them, right? Look at that. What do we notice? Pluralism. The first thing that we notice is the plurality of the text. The plurality 
of the text. No matter how we view it, we cannot escape the fundamental truth. You can't run from it. You can't escape it. You can't rip it out of your Bible. It's the fundamental truth. Fundamentally meaning it establishes everything. We see words like let us, in our, after our likeness. Why is it significant? Because, now I didn't put it up here on the board, but most of you probably know the Hebrew and you're gonna, you, you already know where I'm going. We see this word when it says, you know, Genesis 126 says the word, then God said. That's a big word in the Hebrew, and it's a word that sometimes gets misappropriated. It is the word Elohim. Now, what's interesting about this word is that this word, anytime I said this, I, I can't remember when I said this, it may have been during Sukkot. When we see the I am after uh, words within Scripture, it always, always means more than one. It's plural. But this particular word, which is what makes it so unique, is used, watch this, in a singular text, Plurally, if I can say it like that. So he's using a word that's plural, Elohim, but he's using it in a singular text, God. Notice there's not what? What's missing off this and then God? What's missing? If we're going to use it plural, what's missing off that word? An S. It's used in the singular text, in a singular uh, tense, but it's a plural word. Just knowing that, we know, because we do the Shema, right? Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu Adonai, God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, now I know that part, but wait a minute. I'm seeing this word God, and it's singular, but it means pluralism. I'm, I'm lost. Good. Now you're getting on the right track. Praise God, right? That's Hebrew for you, right? So we know that he's referring to what we call the Godhead. The Godhead, pluralism. So not only is Jesus the radiance of Yahweh's glory, but he's also the exact representation. This makes sense when we begin to look at this word Elohim. Jesus is God himself. The fullness of God, it's not that God is three parts and we're going to have three different thrones and we're going to have three things. No. It's all one. He is the exact representation. That's what Hebrews is saying. He's the imprint of God. He's the glory of God. The very God who spoke in the Old Testament time. The Greek word for being a hypostasis means the very substance of God means the very substance of God, the Greek word for exact representation or character, was used in ancient times to express an imprint, an image. Thus, Jesus is visible expression of God's invisible being. We get a perfect picture of Yahweh when we look at Christ. That's the beauty of it. Like, I was reading this this morning. I was reading, um, I believe it's Exodus 33, and someone can check me on that. But I believe it's in Exodus 33 where Moses is he's asking God, man, hey, pass by me. I want to see you. But God said, I can't do that because if, my glory, if you see my glory, you will die. But then we see throughout Scripture where there's places where God has conversations with men. Could it be that when Moses, when God passed by Moses, Moses seen the backside of Messiah? Biblically, we can prove it. Because we know that Messiah is the exact imprint. It's the exact glory. It's the exact representation of the Father. You need more? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who said, let, shine light, let light shine out of the darkness, is the one, <laughs> is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge, watch this, of the glory of God in the face of Messiah. What does he do? 
He ignites our hearts so that when we see the face of Messiah, what do we see? The knowledge of the glory of God. We see God. This is like, it just can, it just can, for me, who like, I, this is the kind of stuff that just go, woo, I'm so glad I'm a believer. It's because you can't make this up. In Messiah Yeshua is the glory of Yahweh. In other words, when we look at Jesus, we see God. If you needed more evidence to the glory of God on Yeshua, okay, no problem. I'm here all day. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh. We know this, right? Tabern- we just celebrate Sukkot. And tabernacled among us. We looked upon His glory. What glory? The glory of the one and only from the Father. Full of grace and truth. I don't have a mic. I could like maybe I could take my headset off and just drop it. Would that? I don't know. I don't know. I just that's a mic drop. Please don't do that. <laughs> Help the guy. Please don't do that. That's powerful though, isn't it? The glory of the one only from the Father, an exact imprint of the Father. What fascinates me in our discussion today is what the author of Hebrews is doing. It really just. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to bring you around to see. And I was going to be like, that's a lot of information. I know, but it's so good. Like, it's so good to see whoever is writing this letter, man, he knows what he is doing to the Jewish people. He's destroying their theology. See, because you got to understand, Jewish people believe that a man would rise up. A man would rise up and be a Messiah. We've already seen it. Recently, it's like just a couple of years ago, there's a rabbi, I don't know what his name was, but there's a rabbi that they were saying, this is the Messiah. I don't know where he is now, but apparently we're still here, so, right? But that's what they believe. They believe that one of their own would rise up. This is what startled the apostles. Because when they came on, when Jesus was there, they're thinking, man, man, the kingdom's going to come. We're going to wipe out the Roman Empire. All this great stuff's going to happen. And he says, man, I'm leaving you. What? What? Wait a minute. Aren't you the promised one that's supposed to come in and whoop these guys and do all this military stuff and, and regain authority? here? I'm kind of that guy, but not the one you're thinking. That's why they had a hard time recognizing him. They couldn't recognize him. That's powerful. Here's something else. Why are they rejecting salvation today? Why do the Jewish people... you got to hear this, Gentile. You want to reach, reach the Jewish people? You better hear this. Why are they rejecting him? I don't want to go there yet. They believe that as Christians, we follow pagan gods. So here's what I've noticed, right? And, and I've, I've heard other, other teachers talk the same thing, right? Is that... We go in and we try to minister to a Jewish person. We try to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. This, you're going to get stuck. You're going to get stuck. You know what you need to do? Walk them through Hebrews. You got to walk them through Hebrews because they believe Jesus is a pagan God. This is why I say this is the most Jewish letter that the Jewish people will read. This is the best letter that a a Jewish man or woman can read to bring them over to Messiah. Because it's written by a Jew to a Jew trying to convince them of the gospel. Now, let's jump into a couple of scriptures you guys are pretty familiar with. Let's look over at John 1.1. Let's look at John 1.1. Most of you all know this. And there's a part that I think this is where the Lord, uh, if if he gives me the freedom, I want to talk about something that's kind of related to this. But John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? Good stuff, right? It's powerful, popular scripture. Everybody, in most, most, most uh, messianics understand this text. I, I want to give you something, though, just a little bit of, maybe just a little bit more support, is that we look at this word logos, or logos, depending on how, you, you know, how your Texanese is, according to uh, Ronnie. Logos, which is the same word we get in the Hebrew, it's the same word for debar. It simply means written word. Now, I want us to notice something extremely life-changing within this text. 
right? Now, I wanna also, I'm also going to trail off of this because there's something else I think that's very important in this, and this is what the Lord gave me during worship. Now, many of you all know this passage, but, but, but here, this is what I want you to look at, right? I want you to look at this. In the beginning was the Word. When? When? In the beginning. Question. When's the beginning? Creation. Doesn't say creation. It says the beginning. I rest my case. Okay, we'll move right on through that. Because I'm in the same place. I'm like, the beginning's the beginning. Well, when's the beginning? In the beginning. How do you know it's the beginning? Because that's when it began. Right? You're welcome. I'll be here all day. If I, I can't wait to hear the table talk on Oneg tonight, right? Praise the Lord. Like, what is Pastor Mike drinking in his coffee? Like, watch this, though. Now, I want us to notice something extremely life-changing. And, and many of you know the passage, right? We know this part. Watch this. And the Word was God. In the beginning was what? The Word. And who was the Word? Now, we can go in and bring down verse 14 if you want me to. Right? What's verse 14? And the Word became flesh. When did he exist? In the beginning. Well, who was he? The Word. See, this, this is literally, this is a mere reflection, since we're using that, of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning. How powerful is that? For some reason, there are people that believe that Jesus was a created being. I have a hard time with that. Why? John 1.1. 1, 1. Genesis. The passage we just read in Genesis. He wasn't just a man. Praise the Lord. And this is what I said last time in Yom Kippur. I said, that is real love, isn't it? I mean, think about this for a moment. The real love. Like, what's real love? Jesus defines love for us. And how does, he, how does he define it? No greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He's prophetically speaking of his love for mankind. He prophetically speaks, I'm going to show you how much I love you. Like Caleb was up here and he's talking about dads and, and how like dads need to like step up our game, right? And, and our, like, what greater, what father would allow their child to get harmed and just step back and watch? I hope no men in here. I hope we would lay down our lives for our children. But we're made in the image of our Father. He put that in us. Why? Because He did it for us. He comes down in the form of flesh. Why? So we can all recognize Him. But not only that, to demonstrate to us how we can live in this world by His Torah and in this life. To live for Him. Not based upon traditions and religion. That's what the Pharisees thought. He comes on the scene and says, no, 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 no. Let me show you something. Let me show you how to do this. This word in the Greek, matter of fact, let me back up. I don't know if I have that next. Do I have it? I don't. Let me back up real quick. I want you to see this phrase because I, I didn't put the phrase up here, but you can go and study if you got you Greek people, geek people, Greek geek people. You can go back and look at this. This is absolutely amazing. In the Greek, it literally says, God was the Word. That's powerful. He was the Word. I think I've shared this story before. I've had people tell me, ask me one time, when, especially when we were Sunday church, they'd ask me, Mike, why do you always talk about Yahweh, but you don't talk about Jesus all the time? And I just looked at him. I am. Praise the Lord. They got to get there first. Praise the Lord. You're right, brother. You're right. Lord, bless them. Be with them. Literally, literally meaning he is the word of God. When we see this in scripture, it gives some new light and insights to the entire scriptures. It'll absolutely change the way you view your Messiah. And the way you view Yahweh, for they are one and the same. Now, the reason I want to I want to I want to pause for a moment because we talked about this word, the word. I want to go back and just show it real quick. 
And I don't have the scripture verses down, but I am going to read you a verse that I think is super important. Matter of fact, I have my Bible open to it right, well, right now. There we go. This is so good. I want you guys to get this. Because if we truly believe this, if we believe that the word is God, that he is the Elohim that scripture is teaching about, and we believe that Yeshua is the image of Yahweh, and we believe John 1.14, that the word became flesh, then I want to bring something to your, to your thinking for just a moment. I want you just to process something. And this is where some motivational stuff is going to come in. I want you to hear this, Matthew 4.4. 4. This is powerful. But he replied, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're not studying this, if you don't look into this, that can really just go over your head and go, okay, yeah, God's word, yeah, the Bible, I get it. But you're missing it. Because when you go back into the original language, it's beautiful. So I already told you that in John chapter 1, 1, this word that we see here, word, look it up in your, in your, in your, in your Bible dictionaries and stuff, is the word logos. Logos can mean a variety of different things, but its primary meaning is written word. This, spoken by God. Logos. But the word that we're seeing here in Matthew 4.4 4 is a different word. A different word word. It can get confusing. And it's the word rhema. Rhema. R-H-E-M-A. And you want to know what that means? For some of you, this may be something that you needed this morning. It means revealed. It means revealed. The revealed word of Lagos. The revealed word of God. Well, what does that have to do with anything? If you know who he is, and you take his word, his Lagos, and you begin to read it, and you begin to meditate on it, have you ever had that aha moment? Huh? You're reading the Bible. Like, like one of mine that I talk about a lot was 1 Peter 2 and 24. That was an aha moment years and years and years ago when I was a young, young man. And Robin used to pray. We used to pray over Robin. A lot of you don't know, Robin used to have a horrible, horrible allergy. A cat, you couldn't even get a cat within 20 miles of Robin. She would like swell up, man, look like an alien. Man, I loved her. I stayed with her. All right? I asked her today, I was like, are you going to be in class or in, uh, in, in here today, praise God? So y'all don't tell her. But what we learned, we read this passage over and over again, 1 Peter 2 and 24, by his stripes we're healed, by his stripes we're healed. And then I got that aha moment. I'm like, wait a minute. By his stripes, I'm healed. Like, why do we, why do we lay hands on people and anoint them with oil? I don't know. By his stripes, we're healed. Light bulb. And you get that aha moment, right? That aha moment is what the Bible defines as a rhema. As a rhema. Notice the word doesn't say logos. What does that mean? It doesn't say that man shall live by every logos, but by every rhema significantly different. So you can know this, and I know many, you know many who know this Bible, who can quote it, but they're lacking rhema. They're lacking revelation of his word. They're lacking that aha moment. Here's how that works. Can you understand now that when God says, man, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that proceeds from the mouth of God. How do we? I'm going to give you a backstory to this, right? Think about it like this. Joshua, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. When he's out praying, right? And, and this, this angel of light appears to him, right? And so he's fitting to go to battle, right? Joshua's like, he's armed. He's, he's like, got a sword, but he's like, right now. And he asks this angel one very important question. He says, whose side are you on? Now, I want you to show something. This is so good. What is he, what's the angel? I'm not on anybody's side. I'm not on your side. I'm not on their side. I'm on the Lord's side, right? And then he tells Joshua something so significantly powerful, and I want you to get this this morning. 
And this is why I want, I felt like the Lord allowed me to, to bring this out. Is because why? What's what he tell him? He says, he says, Joshua, everywhere you put your foot, the Lord is going to give it to you. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you're in your bedroom one night and you're in prayer and all of a sudden there's an angel of the Lord that appears, appears to you and you've been sick and he looks at you and he says, when you believe in me, you'll be healed. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a word of faith movement. I just want you to understand what the scripture really says. How many, and, and, and then your husband wakes up or your wife wakes up and you say, man, I had this amazing encounter. And the guy said he wasn't on my side, he wasn't on their side. Man, he said all this stuff. And then he said, man, if I'll believe in him, I'll have victory. And they say to you, you should have stopped at two pieces of pizza. I think you ate a little too much. I'm like, no, 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 it really happened. I'm going to believe God for that, okay. And then you tell your girlfriends or your buddies, right? Like, man, you ain't going to believe what happened. But I'm like, dude, like, are you drinking again? Like, I thought God delivered you of that. But you know what you're going to do? I'm going to tell you what you won't do. You will not give up. You will not quit. You will not deny what Yahweh says in his word because he's given you revelation of it. And you'll stand on it. Why do you think Moses can do what Moses did? What was one of the significant factors? He's talking to a burning bush. How many of you have talked to a burning bush? We were at Sukkot, a lot of fires. Any conversations? What's my point? You got that aha moment. You got that revelation, that rhema, not just Bible text. How does that come? It can only come from studying the word from meditating on it. Meditating on it. Are you weak in your faith? Study to show yourself approved. Don't just read the Bible to read the Bible like you would the TV guide. That might have dated me a little bit. I don't even know if they have those anymore. Or the newspaper, right? Or any of that. You read it. This is the very words of Yahweh. And then when he gives you a word, a rhema, a revelation of what his word means, you hold on to that. That's your victory. That's what builds faith. That would build you up that no matter what's going on in the society or the world around you, you have something to stand on. Not just a logos. Not just his written word. We know his word says, 1 Peter 2 and 24, by his stripes we're healed. Well, I understand. I know God wants to heal me. I've heard that so many times. Well, yeah, of course God wants to believe, wants me to be healed, but they don't believe it. They don't have the rhema of his word. And that's why you can see some people, even within our community, right? You see some people in our community, man, they're so passionate. They're so on fire for the Lord. Why? Revelation, rhema. And other people, they're just very, very dogmatic. They're very stuck in, like... Like, you don't see joy in them. You don't see, like, happiness. You don't see, you don't see Yahweh's, like, they're not witnessing to people. They're not, why? Rhema. One has it, one does not. It's a game changer. But it can only come when you make the decision that I'm going to dwell in his presence. I'm going to stand on his word. I'm going to read his Torah. I'm going to ask him, Lord, reveal yourself to me in your word. That's when it becomes a game changer. Some of you need victory in your life. And you're waiting for man. You're looking at man for that rhema. You're looking at mankind to tell you everything's going to be all right. And you won't go to Yahweh's logos and meditate on it. Thank you. Thank you. Is that my timer? That's good. You're waiting on it. You get everybody, you get your revelation from everybody but Yahweh. You need an attaboy. Oh, you're doing such a good job. Do you know that can be an addiction? Do you know that? where you're looking for man's approval, man's opinion, rather than the very opinion of Yahweh? Man shall not live by bread alone. Can you get that for a moment? Like, we're not supposed to live on just physical substance. We are to live through his revelation of his word in us. And we, go, and we take that and you look at John 1.1 1, 1 again. Oh, my goodness. It's a game changer. It's a game changer for us people. Why is it important that you know who Yeshua is? The Word. Powerful. All right. Thank you, Lord. So we see this passage, the John 1.1. 1, 1, it is the passage of passages. And it connects us back to Genesis 1.1. And then if, if Genesis 1.1 is not enough and, and you need more Bible verses, well, let's just go to the end of the book. 
Revelation 19, 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Is that not enough? Do we not just see in John 1, 1 that he is called the Word of God? And in Revelation, in a description of Messiah, he's called the Word of God. This is like when I understood who I was worshiping, it literally changed everything about me. It changed me because he's the God of the universe. Right? This is what Hebrews is signifying. Isn't that what Hebrews says? Right? Psalm 33 and 6. Watch this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. By Adonai's word were the heavens made. Wait a minute. What are we studying here? Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days he has spoken to us through a son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the universe. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh my goodness, I'm getting like just... Oh. Why does this matter? See, I hope, I hope today you're not just getting information. I hope and you're getting revelation of who our king is why we worship him. We're not worshiping three gods. And we're not saying that Elohim is not Echad, that he's not one. He is one. But he manifests himself to us in a way that we could see him. And that was in the way of his son. Colossians 1.16 For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, why do we worship him? He created everything. The seen and the unseen, whether thrones, angelic powers, or rulers, or authority. In other words, church, everything was created by him. This is exactly what the book of Hebrews is conveying to its readers, i.e. the Jewish people. That everything was made by his son and everything is held together by his son, Yeshua. And the two are not different. They're not separate. They are one. This is why we worship Yahweh. This is why we call upon Yeshua. All was created through him and for him. And this dumbfounds me some because the Jewish rabbis have a high regard for angels. They believe in the, in the spiritual and the supernatural things of angels. They love it. Matter of fact, many of the uh, writings of, uh, I believe his name's Mamanade, uh, Mom, somebody can help me with that. Yeah, Mamanades, uh, we see it in the Talmud, we see in the Mishnah, where they held high regard to the, 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 to, to the angels. But yet they can't believe in Messiah Yeshua. This, in my opinion, is why the author brings this up. I believe that's why. He's trying to establish a connection with the Jewish people. Now, yeah, we're going to go ahead and wrap that up. I had a few more pages, but I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, that's very kind. Everybody else is going, shut up, shut up. I'm hungry. Now, I have several pages more, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and break it right there at... I didn't even get into verse 4. I was going to go into it, but let's just, let's just do that. Praise the Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. You're so worthy of praise. You're worthy of praise because of what you have done. You're worthy of everything that we have, everything that we are. You are worthy. Thank you for your Torah. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Today, Lord, as we spend a few moments in prayer, Father, may our heart be convicted on the just immenseness of you, of who you are. In relation to who we are, to everything that you've created, to everything that you've given purpose, may we be compelled, Lord, to reignite faith in our hearts to you. May we be compelled, Lord, no burdened, Father, to worship you with everything 
to not hold anything back. Father, we worship you today in the name of Yeshua. We